Right, you can turn to Genesis 1. That's where our scripture reading will be from in a moment. In our sermon series on the Christian in every stage of life, we've been looking particularly at the church's married people. We did husbands and, or wives and then husbands uh, in that section of this series. Today we're moving on to look at, after people get married, we're kind of moving through the different stages when uh, they then begin to have children. And we're looking then at the church's parents in particular. So we started out, you know, with the little babies, and then we went to little children, and then we went to um, young adults, and then we went to married and now parents. So... Once again, as before, I want to encourage all of you who are not in this particular aspect of the Christian life to take interest in this subject, because we're all supposed to be interested in each other as members of the body of Christ, and we're to encourage each other and to pray for each other. And equally important, we're to behold the glory of Christ and the beauty of Christ in each other. Like we, we looked at little infants and we saw how what we read this morning in Matthew 18, how that, you know, their example to us is one who receives the kingdom of God. So God himself is a father and a son. And of course, he made no mistake in using the same words when he used those words to refer to us as fathers and sons, to refer to parents and children with those terms because there's a, there's a picture that you see of, uh, that's related to that, to describe our relationships. We learn of God the Father then when we see parents who are caring for their children after the example of the Father. They set that before us. And parents learn, of course, by looking at the Father and the great love that is in the, in the Trinity and so on. My plan in looking at the church's parents in, in this portion is to begin with an overview today, looking at what parenting is all about, And then next week to address more practical matters about how to parent. So for our scripture reading today, I selected Genesis 1, 26 through 28. So please give careful attention as I read this to you because it is the word of God. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. There we'll end the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us this morning. I wanted to begin uh, this morning with this section, the section we're beginning with. We're going to be looking at three things overall. The purpose of parenting, filling the earth with godly people. And then the disruption of that purpose and then the Lord's commitment to bring about that original purpose. Okay, so let's get to it. The basic purpose of parenting, first of all, is to fill the earth with godly people. From the beginning, God called the man and his wife, as we see right here in our text, to bring forth children. You see verse 28, where he tells them to be fruitful and multiply. So obviously talking about bringing forth children. He has created them, and there are only two of them in all the world at this time. He wants them to fill the earth with people. To be fruitful is to produce life, and to multiply is to reproduce yourself. So that's what God is calling them to do, to reproduce people like themselves. The earth is very big. And the Lord is telling them to fill it up. So this mandate was not something that they were going to do on the weekend. This is going to be a big project that would take years and years to accomplish. It was an ongoing task that they had been given and that we still have today. 
When he says to subdue the earth, he is basically telling them to do what he did when he planted the garden for them. God was very gracious to them because, you know, it's hard to go into a wild land and have to tame everything and to cultivate a garden and start growing things. God went ahead and and cultivated a place for them. He made a garden for them. And they are to bring the earth into subjection to human purposes. Not in a way that destroys the earth, but in a way that enhances its beauty and usefulness for mankind, for one another. It's a way that we show love to each other. We cultivate land to produce good things for each other that we plant. We plant gardens for beauty. We use the earth's resources. We take lumber and we build things that are pleasant and useful for one another. It's how we show love to each other. Everything from making jewelry to making supper is involved. Right here in the creation account, it tells about the gold that was in the land and the precious stones that were there. God built all of these things into his creation and he delights in our use of them as a way of blessing each other. But this calling to fill the earth was more than a command to be obeyed. It was that, but it was also a blessing to be received. When God speaks in this manner, his word carries with it a power to bring forth what he calls for. For example, earlier he said, let there be light. And there was light. Sort of like the commander of an army. He can say, you know, go to this place. And all that, a, whole, a whole number of troops goes to the place where he instructed them. But you see, God's power is greater than that because he says, let there be light. And there's light. Light didn't obey God the way a person with understanding does, but God's word brought it into being by his divine and marvelous power. The same way when he called for the earth to bring forth living creatures after their kinds, his call actually caused living creatures to come forth according to their kinds. So here, in calling Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, God is in fact, also as it says in the text, blessing them with the ability to be fruitful and multiply. Something that they couldn't have possibly done apart from God enabling them to do that. And what a marvelous ability it is. Just think of it. That we, we, we don't notice it because it's so common to us. But just think of what a marvelous thing it is. Well, I guess uh, young fathers and, and mothers, if they aren't too weary at the time, <laughs> notice that when it occurs, what a, what a great marvelous thing it is. It's so striking that we bring forth a living human being, a soul that can think and walk and work, that can love, that can know God. And God has given us that wonderful ability. It's a, it's a marvelous thing. God in His goodness and power, He built it right into us when He made us, and he, na- he enables us to do it. Just stop and think about the remarkable creativity or the imagination of God that's back of that blessing. Our Creator is the one who came up with this whole idea that children or animals or plants or anything like that should be brought forth in the way that they're brought forth. So that they are like us. When we bring them forth, they're like us, but yet they're different than us. God God made a, a marvelous means by which we know that it's another person. We don't bring forth a duck or an ostrich or something like that, but we bring forth another person but then at the same time, they're different. They have, they have different features, different characteristics. But even so, similarities with the parents that brought them forth more than to other parents. That God, God had a, a marvelous arrangement of things. And he came up with that. He came up with that whole idea of, of reproduction and put it into his creation. Just think of the mind that, that calls that into something to do that out of, when there's nothing there. When we do things, we're always imitating and copying something that's already done. But God, out of nothing, called all of this forth. The more we learn about the complexities that that bring all this about, that make it so that 
different people come, they look like other people, but yet they're different and all those things, the more we ought to praise our designer and the more ludicrous it gets for those who would try to deny him. <laughs> Such complex, marvelous design obviously requires a designer. It was always ludicrous to think otherwise, but even more so as we learn about the complexities of the genome and the, of DNA and all of these things. It becomes more and more irrational all the time. No wonder that people today are more and more divorcing their minds from reality. We have that kind of disjunction between what we think and what is real, so that even to the point that people are claiming identities that are contrary to biological realities. How do you do that? You can't do that unless you're living in an irrational framework where you're not really seeing things as they obviously are. You have to divorce your mind from the observable world to believe in biological macro evolution. Seeing all that complexity that it just grew up, formed out of uh, random occurrences. It's, it's preposterous. God was the designer and the praise and glory goes to him. But what were these children that we are to bring forth supposed to look like? Well, they were to be like their parents. It was Adam and Eve as they were straight from the hand of God, created in the image of God. It was children like them that were to be multiplied when God made that call and that blessing to them. He wanted them to multiply beings like the beings that he had just created. And what were Adam and Eve like when they were first created? Well, they were the image of God. The call to multiply comes right after the statement in the verse before that God made the man and woman after his own image. That means that they were like God in certain ways. Not that they physically look like God. Not that they were to try to take God's place. To be like him in his unique position and role as the only true God. As his only, the only one that can be in that, that, that place who created all things. That was Satan's version of being like God. That you, you take the place of God. That No, no, the image of God is not that. It's more like a, a reflection on a human level of the divine glory and person. They, they were to be like him and reflecting his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth on a human level. They were to be like him in loving each other the way that the three persons of the Trinity had always loved one another in the divine being, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And not only that, but they were in full harmony with God as they came from his hand. He made them upright. He was delighted with them. They were righteous before him. They were, at first, completely without sin. As creatures, they knew that they were there for God. It was for them to obey because he was God who made them. Now, this would be painfully obvious to us if we weren't fallen. It, obviously, you're here for your creator to obey him. It was obvious to them. They were also God's worshipers. They marveled at his infinite, eternal, and unchangeable being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. They marveled at the power that had called forth the earth. They were full of praise to him. They were full of thanksgiving to him for all the goodness, the beautiful things that were before their eyes in the earth, the relationship that he had given them with each other. It was their delight to worship him on the Sabbath day, to set apart that day, and to come and praise his name, as they were instructed to do shortly after this in the beginning of chapter 2. Just think how beautiful such a world would be. A world that was filled, that God was calling for. A world that was filled with people like that. People that were true reflection of God living together in the earth. What love would be seen? What harmony would be seen? What care for one another? What delight in each other? What purity? What joy? What gladness? We, we can't even imagine 
what it would be like. But from what soil were these children to come forth, this fruit? Were they to be nurtured? Where were they to be nurtured and cultivated? What was the place of cultivation of these children, of bringing them forth? Well, the soil from which they were to come forth was marriage. God designed it that children would be conceived in the embrace of a man and a woman. This did not just happen. God designed it this way with male and female. It was intentional that children be brought forth in the way they're brought forth. Once again, we have reason to marvel at the imagination of God. Who would have ever thought of such a thing? Only God. He came up with that whole idea. Not mindless mother nature. This is clearly a designed and beautiful thing that God came up with. What a beautiful way to be conceived in an act of beautiful, tender love. It's a sacred act that is to be cherished and that is to be revered. By dishonoring sexual union, our society has at the same time, oddly enough, become obsessed with it. By trashing it, we have become obsessed with it. As is seen from everything that goes on in our society, from addiction to pornography to the molestation of children. These are all manifestations of obsession with something that you have in fact trashed from its original design and purpose. God instituted it as we saw recently when we looked at marriage that a man would leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. Remember we read that a few weeks ago in, um, in chapter uh, 2 when we were looking at marriage. And, and that the two, he, he designed it that the two would become one flesh. By God's institution, when they are joined together as husband and wife, they become one flesh, one body. They are to see themselves as one body, as we saw in Ephesians, so that a man would love his wife, so that he would nourish and cherish her, as we looked at last week, as his own body. Children were meant to be brought forth out of and from this rich abiding relationship between a woman and a man in a home where the husband deliberately pours out his life to nourish his wife and to cherish her. You remember that was to warm her is what that word means. It has all sorts of implications, physical implications, spiritual implications, just happiness, to cherish her, to warm her as he embraces her, to comfort her spiritually with the, with the promises of the Lord. Just as Jesus does the church, nourishes us and cherishes us, where he tenderly provides for her in every way, spiritually, physically, and in general happiness, even sacrificing to do so. And she, she is to blend her life with his in a beautiful submission to his agenda as the head of the home. What a lovely thing, this home that God designed when he brought man and woman together. What a fine soil is this for a child to be nurtured in. It's the plan of God. There's already, before that child, you see, a father, when that child comes into the world, a father nourishing and cherishing his wife. Now the children are brought under that same care to be nourished and cherished in that home. And not only that, but before them is the example of their mother, cheerfully blending her life alongside of her husband as the head of the home. Truly, this is excellent soil for a child this is the soil that God chose for little image bearers to be planted in until they grew up and became big image bearers who had their own homes. That was the design of God. How lovely this was. How perfect was the plan of God in these things. But now we must turn from this beautiful subject to a dark subject. We must look at the disruption of this arrangement. 
the degradation of parenting. Sin came into the world. The image bearers that God wanted multiplied became lying images of God. They were still image bearers like we saw recently, but poor ones. An image bearer is obviously supposed to look like that which it is an image of. They became images that told lies, like a false painting of someone that distorts their character rather than showing it. You know how this came about. The one that John in Revelation calls the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, came into the garden and deceived the whole world in our first parents, the only humans that were alive. He told her, told Eve, that by rebelling against God, by exerting her independence, she would become like God. You remember what I said about Satan earlier? You become in charge. Now, not God, but you decide what is good. You decide what is morally evil. Now you can do what you want, not God. Satan made her think that subjection to God was dehumanizing, that it would be better for her to be free of that connection. And her husband Adam followed her in that rebellion. What a horrendous thing it was. This beautiful couple called to bring forth beautiful worshiping image bearers of God rejected God as their God. They were no longer good soil to bring forth beautiful children. They were corrupt soil that could only bring forth corrupt children. Jesus said a good tree brings forth good fruit and an evil tree brings forth evil fruit. No longer would they live and move in harmony with God's will. They were severed from him as their God. Immediately, the ugliness into which they had fallen began to show itself. Adam accused Eve of leading him into rebellion. Instead of following her into rebellion, Adam should have come before the Lord as the later Adam did and said, punish me, Lord, for what she did. But instead, he followed her with eyes open into that rebellion. The kind of love that says, punish me for what she did, was gone from the earth now until that one came who brought that back into the world again. The excellent soil that God had made for bringing forth children was ruined and spoiled. Now corrupt children will be brought up in the home where there was abuse, blame shifting, negligence, excuses, selfishness, anger, bitterness, whining, treachery on the part of the man, and insubordination, rebellion, disrespect, resentment, murmuring on the part of the wife, and ungodliness in both of them. Let me tell you, this is not what God wanted multiplied in the earth, what he called for to be multiplied in the earth. In his sovereignty, all things happen according to his divine plan and will. But what he called for was not what was multiplied in the earth now in this way. He made himself very clear about that. As soon as the rebellion occurred, he drove the man and the woman out of the garden. They were not fit to live there. He told the woman that she would have trouble in doing the very thing of bringing forth children. And I think beyond just bring, giving birth to them, which is trouble enough, but also in rearing them and training them up, there would be hardships and trouble and, and also in her relationship with her husband. It would feel, she would feel more like a slave under his rule than like one that was nourished and cherished. And he told Adam that he would have much trouble now in providing for his family, in subduing the earth and cultivating it for, for his loved ones. But most striking of all, he told them that they would die and return to the dust from which they had been made. God made them from the dust to have dominion over the dust of the earth, and now they are to return to the dust again. They were no longer fit to live upon the earth. That was how incensed God was with what they had become and what they would now bring forth. Such image bearers must die and they must be cast out 
from the presence of God. This is how God showed his displeasure from the start. And then, after they did multiply and fill the earth, he said they would still bring forth children, and they did, and they filled the earth. It was full of people. There were people everywhere. You, you do calculations on that with how quickly they were likely bringing forth children when they lived those long lives and everything. It could easily be a population rivaling what we have today. And then what happened? Well, God showed them again how displeased he was with what they were and with what they brought forth. Here they had filled the earth with corrupt children instead of godly children, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. In, in Genesis chapter 6, he saw that every intent of their heart was only evil continually. So he sent a great flood to cleanse the earth of them all. It was the most violent thing, this flood. It was the storm of all storms. The ground opening up and shooting forth water and water coming down from above and, and winds and, and storms. Waters bursting forth to scour the earth of the filth of mankind that was upon it. A corrupt and vile thing in the eyes of God that demanded cleansing. The multiplication of ungodly people. The human race fallen from God. Clearly, God was testifying for all ages that he did not approve of what was being multiplied on the earth. What had been his delight at creation was now offensive to him. It was never the mere multiplication of people that God was looking for when he told them to be fruitful and multiply. It was the multiplication of godly people that he was looking for. Indeed, this was terrifying. It is terrifying to us. How must the Lord look at us today? And all of our sin and corruption, rebellion all over the earth, how vile we are before His eyes. He is a consuming fire. And since that time of Noah, that great flood, the prophets of God, and especially our Lord Jesus Himself, have told us that a day is coming when the earth is to be purified by fire. All who are on the earth will be called before God and be judged. And all that have ever lived in the past will be raised also to be judged. No one will escape in that day. Jesus tells us that in that day, He Himself will be the one who orders the wicked to be cast into the lake of fire with the devil forever. God has no interest in filling the earth with ungodly, wicked creatures. This is not excessive on the part of God. This is not a defect or an overreaction on the part of God. This is the divine love, purity, and holiness of God manifested. If God was okay with wickedness, He would be wicked Himself. He is not okay with wickedness. He will not have His world filled with such things. We'll never, we would have no hope of a glorious heaven if God did not hate sin. He will expunge it. He will not have it on His earth. Never His intention for the earth to be filled with such. Never His call. God will never tolerate corruption in His image bearers. His purpose is that the earth be filled with godly people who live beautifully as His image bearers and worshipers. And now... I want to assure you that the Lord our God, who is mighty, will not be kept from His purpose. His original purpose that we read about in Genesis 1.28 with Adam and Eve. He will fill the earth with godly people. And His voice, with, with His voice of condemnation, there was also a voice of grace that was heard. The voice of grace was heard in the garden. In Genesis 3.16, the woman, as I mentioned before, was told of sorrow and childbearing, but she was also told that she would bring, still bring forth children. Still bring forth children. Likewise, the man was told that he would have trouble providing, but still he would eat out of the ground. And besides that, animals were killed to clothe the man and the woman. And they were taught that by the shedding of the blood, there was forgiveness. How do, we, 
how do we surmise that? It doesn't say that directly. It says they were clothed with the skins of animals, but how do we know that they were taught about blood sacrifice? We know that because we see immediately with their sons and so on that they are offering sacrifices. They didn't make that up. God directed them to do that. So we surmise, it's a good and necessary deduction, that God told them what this was about. We deduce this because from then on, we see people that came from Adam and Eve offering sacrifices. Now, they went into idolatry, and they did it in idolatrous ways. But God's people, of course, he continued to instruct in the offering of sacrifices until that sacrifice that he appointed was offered, the Lord Jesus Christ. And even more clearly, when God spoke to the serpent, he told him in the hearing of Adam and Eve that he would raise up a seed to the woman whose heel would be crushed but who would then crush the head of the serpent, who would slay him. God would bring forth an insurrection against the insurrection of Satan. A son born of woman would be an end to Satan and would cleanse the earth of rebellion and of the rebellious. All the while, as wicked children were being brought forth then over the years... Okay, children, wicked children were being brought forth. God at the same time was bringing forth people that were to be restored to him, that, that would be restored to him. A people that would be restored by Jesus and sanctified by his spirit to be a pure and holy people of righteousness. That was God's purpose of grace. Right alongside of the wicked reproducing, so God had his people. The voice of grace was heard distinctly at the great flood where we saw that the voice of judgment was so loud. We're told in the midst of all the dreadful prophecy of the flood that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Splendid. That grace that Noah found, that's the grace for all of us. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be God's people. We wouldn't be here if not for that. Noah was preserved in the ark with his family. And upon exiting the ark, what did he do? In thanksgiving to God, he offered blood sacrifice. Sacrifices to atone for sin and to give thanks to God. God then commanded Noah to be fruitful and multiply. To fill the earth. With who? With redeemed people like himself. People that those sinful look to the promise of Christ for cleansing. People that were taught to look to God as Noah looked to God. God was bringing forth a people for himself to fill the earth. Yes, much wickedness filled the earth very soon again after Noah. But grace continued to sound forth all the while it came especially to a man named Abram whose name was changed to Abraham. God told this man that he would bless him and that he would make his name great, that he would become a great nation. He showed him that it would be by his almighty power that a son would come forth from his body who would bring blessing to all the nations. It is clear that the people that came forth from Abraham were just like the people of other nations. Israel was no different, except what? God preserved them. God's grace kept them. That was the only difference with them. They continually went astray. They were always going after idols, following their corrupt hearts. They, were, they would have been wiped out. They would have gone into the darkness of idolatry just like everyone else, except God kept chastening them. He kept calling them back. He sent famines to chasten them. He sent judges to lead them and correct them and bring them back. He sent enemies to humble them. And he sent prophets again and again and again to call them back so that they would not go astray. If he'd done that to another nation, it would have had the same result. There was nothing different about them but the grace of God. He simply would not let them go because he had purposed to redeem them and that through them the world would be filled with godly people. Among them were redeemed people that would be those godly people and that would bring forth the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the fullness of time, having preserved these people as his own, he brought forth the promised son, 
to redeem them. The son born of woman was none other than the son of God, conceived in human flesh to establish a people of human flesh for God on the earth. He himself followed the Lord fully as no other man had ever done. He was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And then he himself, unlike Adam, unlike Adam, said, punish me for what they did. That which was gone now came back. And here was this righteous, godly man who loved as no one loved and said, punish me for what they did. Instead of following us in the rebellion, the Father had sent him to do this very thing, that he might have a purified people to fill the earth. He was the blood sacrifice that God appointed and showed forth through the sacrifices to atone for sin. It was necessary by this, in this way to make it clear that God must punish sin. To pardon without this would bring great dishonor to God because it would say that sin was acceptable to our holy God. It is not acceptable. It required nothing less than the shed blood of the very Son of God. No other, no other could do that. Even an unfallen man could not do that. It had to be the Son of God in order to atone for our guilt. And all along, as the prophets had foretold, it was God's plan when the Son came into the world to then redeem people from the nations, the Gentiles. And so he sent his people out to the nations with his Holy Spirit to help them. And they preached the good news about Jesus coming to restore us to God by his death on the cross. And all those whom God has appointed to eternal life believe they come looking to Jesus with joy and delight who is crucified. They look to him for forgiveness that they might be delivered from service to Satan and restored to be God's people, restored to him as their God and their Lord. God is filling the earth with these people. He's multiplying them. He is going to have the earth filled with godly people. In the end, his plan will not be thwarted. But what does this have to do with parents? Is it just that God is going to fill the earth with godly people that are called from the nations? Is that the only way that God is going to fill the earth is by evangelism and calling people who know not God into the kingdom? No, God also fills the earth with godly people through Christian parents, from Christian homes. The church has a twofold mandate for filling the earth with godly people. Yes, we are to go and preach the gospel to all nations. Woe to us if we don't. We are to call them to trust in Jesus for forgiveness and to come and join us as his people, his church, his redeemed people who trust in him. We are to baptize them when they profess him. We are to teach them how to live as his people following Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But those who believe are also called, the second thing, to bring up their children in the nurture and discipline of the Lord. It's those who are in the Lord that are to be brought up in the nurture and discipline of the Lord. God declared from the beginning that his promise was to those he called and to their children with them. To you and to your children. That's the scriptural formula. Noah and his children were all on the ark. Abraham and his seed were given the promise along with the sign of circumcision to show that God was their God and they his people. And when Peter first preached the gospel after Jesus had risen and ascended, he declared that the promise is to you and to your children. He said that when they were being baptized, and from then on, all the baptisms that we see are household baptisms if there is a household involved. We might say that when you are redeemed by Jesus and you marry, you and your spouse become the soil out of which God brings forth redeemed children. Repeat that. We might say that when you're redeemed by Jesus and you marry, you and your spouse become the soil out of which God brings forth redeemed children. We saw that at creation, marriage was the soil out of which godly children were to be brought forth before the fall. It was good soil, 
because the children were brought up in a home with a man who nourished and cherished his wife as his own body and with a woman who cheerfully conformed her life to his as her head. We saw how the children were brought into that place of love, how they were trained up in that soil as godly people. Well, now the marriage of redeemed people is the soil out of which godly children are to be brought forth. We are to marry only in the Lord, believers only to marry believers. And in these homes, husbands are to love their wives now as Christ loved the church. We have an example and gave himself for her, what we've been studying about recently. They are to nourish and cherish their wives, not only as always, but even now as Christ nourishes and cherishes the church. And the wives are to submit to their own husbands, not just as they always were, but now as the church sub cheerfully submits to Christ, wanting to conform our lives to him, to follow him. Such couples being redeemed by Christ are to bring up their children in the Lord. They're to bring them up as those who look to Jesus for the forgiveness of sin in a home where he is served. They're to bring forth children in the soil of a home where prayer and the word are heard, where the Lord is worshiped in the name of Jesus Christ. God's promise is to us and to our children. Election is random in one sense, but in another, it flows particularly through the channel of godly households. God has said it does. If that were not so, then it would be just as likely for you as a Christian for your children to be believers as it would be for your neighbor, your unbelieving neighbor, to have believing children. But such has never been the case. It was not Noah and random individuals that God chose from around the world that were on the ark, but it was Noah and his children that were on the ark. Noah and his sons and their wives. Christian parents have promises and they are to bring their children in the hope of those promises. The promises to us and to our children. It doesn't mean that there will be no Esau along with the Jacob, but they are to look for God to work in their sons and daughters as they bring them up in a godly redeemed household. In Psalm 103, 17 and 18, the Lord promises, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. This is all the more so now that Jesus Christ has come. I say then how glad we ought to be for the church's parents. Here we have the soil that God has given from which godly children come forth and fill the earth. God will have the earth filled with godly people at last. And this is one of his ways of doing that through Christian marriages. The other is through evangelism. Both ways are extremely important. Neither is to be neglected. So let's give thanks for the church's parents and pray for them and for the children that they have brought forth. Pray that they will be faithful so that their children can be brought forth in godly soil, in redeemed soil, that they too might be redeemed. Many churches ignore the special promises to parents today. They refuse to baptize the children of believers and do not insist that those parents bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The children are treated as those outside Christ instead of those who, as God's people always have, have the covenants and the promises and all of the things that God has, has set forth before us. We must insist that Christian parents recognize their calling and we must encourage them in that calling. Next week, we're going to look at ways that parents are to bring up their children in the nurture and discipline of the Lord. But this week, let us rejoice that God is filling the earth in this way. Pray that Christian parents will be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, not just with children, but with godly children. I tell you, at the last day, he will raise up all those who have been redeemed, and they will be brought to perfection in that day. On that day, the wicked will be cast out. Then there will be a new heaven and a new earth filled with godly people redeemed by Jesus Christ. God will have it so. He will not be thwarted. 
He will fill the earth as he purposed from the beginning. Please stand and let's call on his name. Sovereign, eternal, merciful, gracious God, holy God, how we praise you, O Lord, for all that you are and for all that you have done. We praise you, first of all, for being that you are the creator of the heaven and the earth. We, we thank you for creating us and for creating the world and all the things that are in it, for making us out of the dust of the ground and breathing into us the breath of life and giving us the marvelous ability to reproduce ourselves after our own kind. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the glorious power that is seen in the imagination, the, the marvelous ways that you have formed the earth and, and us in it. We're fearfully and wonderfully made, and we praise you, Lord, for these things. We also want to praise you, Lord, that we've been able to be fruitful and multiply. We've been able to bring forth children. And that even when we sinned against you, Lord, when our first parents rejected you as their God, when they set out on their own in their, their wicked independence, the earth became so filled, full of corruption, but all the while your grace was running its channel through those ages. You preserved a people for yourself. We read about the, that family in, in Genesis. Only a thin line, but a people that you preserved in that hostile and wicked world. We praise you, O oh Lord, for how you call them out. Though they were sinners all the same, you preserve them by your grace. You are the one who caused them to differ. And we praise you, O oh Lord, that they followed you and they called upon your name and they trusted you and they offered sacrifices looking to the blood of the covenant that you had promised to take away their sins. We thank you for Noah and how you preserved him in that day when you cleansed the earth from the wicked. Father, we praise you that another day is coming when again you will do the same with fire. We praise you for our Lord Jesus Christ, for that seed of the woman that you promised and that you brought forth, that one who is a lamb without spot or blemish, that one who offered himself for our sins instead of joining us in our rebellion, the one who gave himself to atone for our sins. We praise you, O Lord, that you have accepted him for our sake. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would help us to rejoice in the salvation that you have given us, to marvel at it. And Father, how we pray that the earth would be filled with redeemed people. Father, bless our efforts at evangelism. Bless us as we witness to people who are outside of your covenant, outside of your grace. Help us, Lord, to declare to them the things that you have done, to declare to them the need that they have to repent, to flee from the wrath to come. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would open their ears, open their eyes, that they may see and that they may turn. Give us boldness, Lord, to speak the truth to them. Help us, O oh Lord. We're so weak and fragile in these things. We need your help, Lord. Pour out your spirit on us, even now. We also pray, Lord, that you would bless the parents, parents in this congregation and parents, Christian parents all around the world. Father, that we would recognize the the place that we have been given. Father, that we are a redeemed people and therefore a redeemed household and that we're to bring up our children not outside of that, but in that redemption. And Father, we know that we cannot make them believers. Only you can make them believers. And so we plead with you, Lord, work in us that we might set the, the home in the way that you have appointed. Work in our children by your grace that they might receive the kingdom. We know that Jesus told us how readily children do receive the kingdom. How that when they're in that environment, when they're in that soil, that your spirit works in them and that they receive the kingdom. And Father, how we pray that we might see that, that we might see that in our children. And Father, that we not cause them to stumble, that we not set before them a false testimony of what redemption is and what it is to be your people we might set before them the beauty of the redeemed. Father, what you have called us to be in Christ, the beauty of Christ himself, our leader, our shepherd, the one that we imitate, the one that we follow. Father, help the leaders in the church, the elders to rule well. Help them, O oh Lord, to shepherd the people and to direct them in the ways of the Lord. 
Help those who preach the gospel, Lord, to preach it effectively and faithfully, not compromising, but setting forth your glorious truth as they have been instructed. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for what you have done, Lord. How can we ever return thanks to you, oh, Lord? We, we lift up the cup of salvation in your name. We, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.